Hi, my name is Rich Brown. As a family physician, I've personally witnessed how SBIRT can help many patients. As a professor at the University of Wisconsin, as a director of population health management at a healthcare company, and as a freelance consultant, I've helped dozens of primary care practices implement successful SBIRT programs. In this 10-minute video, I'll give you a crash course on SBIRT and why and how to implement it in primary care settings. Some of the slides I'll show will have more information than I speak to. Feel free to stop the video to take in those details. Before I can talk about SBIRT, I need to explain the continuum of substance use. Each of us and our patients fall into one of five categories with regard to our drinking and drug use. Low risk use is substance use that is not causing problems in someone's life and is unlikely to do so in the future. High risk use is substance use that has not caused any negative health or social consequences, but is likely to do so in the future. Here are the definitions of low risk and high risk drinking, which are based on hundreds of studies comparing drinking patterns of people with and without alcohol related health and social consequences. There has not been enough research to establish similar cutoffs for the high risk use of marijuana or other drugs, but most experts regard daily use of marijuana or any use of other illegal drugs as high risk. Problem use is drinking or drug use that causes negative health and social consequences in people's lives. People in the dependent category usually have a lot of those consequences, but what distinguishes dependence is loss of control over substance use. Many dependent people can quit or cut down for a while, but cannot do so consistently and durably without help. Research has shown that loss of control arises from changes in the pleasure reward system of the brain. Patients who are dependent should be referred for treatment. All patients with alcohol or opioid dependence should be offered pharmacotherapy, which we can administer in primary care settings, especially for patients who cannot or will not get treatment. Patients in the high-risk and problem-use categories significantly outnumber those in the dependent category. Patients in these two categories don't need treatment because they have normal pleasure reward systems and full control over their substance use. Many will reduce their substance use in response to brief interventions. A 5-20 to 20 minute session and 1-3 to three brief follow-ups conducted either in person or by telehealth or phone. Brief alcohol interventions have been shown effective in dozens of randomized control trials. Several trials have shown that brief drug interventions are often effective as well. BI is the sweet spot of SBIRT because a small investment of time with patients in the high risk and problem use categories often reduces substance use, serious illnesses, injuries, disabilities, ED visits, hospitalizations, and deaths. Brief interventions based on education and advice can be effective for some patients, but interventions are even more effective if they employ motivational interviewing, which requires more training. Regardless of intervention method, it's important that people who deliver SBIRT get training that includes practice and feedback from experts. Some dependent patients, many patients with problem use, and most patients with high-risk use go undetected in healthcare settings and don't receive BI or RT. That's why the United States Preventive Services Task Force and many other authorities recommend that all adult patients undergo annual alcohol and drug screening in primary care settings. Positive screens identify patients who might be in the high risk use, problem use, or dependent categories. Patients with positive screens must undergo brief assessment with longer validated questionnaires to determine their category of use and what additional services to deliver. So now the question is how to incorporate SBIRT into busy primary care practices in ways that are logistically and financially feasible. Here's the workflow that works best for most clinics. EHRs prompt receptionists to ask patients to fill out an annual health screening form which contains alcohol and drug screening questions. Medical assistants who check vital signs review patients' responses to the screening questions, and they alert well-trained, dedicated, expert interventionists to see patients with positive screens. Why are dedicated staff necessary? 
First of all, it's critical that brief interventions take place in primary care settings at visits for other reasons, because few patients are willing to schedule separate primary care visits or accept referrals elsewhere to receive brief interventions. Although primary care clinicians can be trained to do SBIRT, many lack interest and most lack the time to deliver robust BI, RT, and follow-ups. Many medical assistants can be trained, too, but most clinics need their MAs available to maintain patient flow. Without dedicated SBIRT staff, it's impossible for most clinics to deliver brief assessment, BI, RT, and follow-ups to the 20% or more of primary care patients who typically screen positive. If PCPs are running on time, at the end of their visits, they ask patients with positive screens to remain and see the SBIRT interventionist. If PCPs are running behind, SBIRT interventionists can often see patients and finish up with them before PCPs enter the room. If PCPs are ready to see patients during SBIRT, the PCP interrupts and the interventionist finishes after the PCP is done. In summary, receptionists initiate the screening process and MAs view patients' responses. For patients who screen negative, MAs reinforce healthy behaviors. For patients who screen positive, the SBIRT interventionist delivers all subsequent services. I'm sure you're wondering now how you could afford to hire and train dedicated SBIRT interventionists. There are three potential sources of revenue. One source is fee-for-service reimbursement. Medicare, most Medicaid programs, and most commercial health plans reimburse for SBIRT. Each plan has its own rules. For example, Medicare reimburses for SBIRT only when it's delivered by licensed professionals, but most Medicaid programs and commercial plans reimburse when licensed professionals or unlicensed paraprofessionals perform SBIRT. You can have your billing staff look into reimbursement policies of your top payers and a financial analyst can figure out whether a higher paid licensed professional or a lower paid paraprofessional would give you the most favorable bottom line. Here's a quick sample calculation to show that revenue from Medicare reimbursement can exceed your interventionist's compensation. SBIRT will never be a huge moneymaker, but fee-for-service reimbursement can allow you to do the right thing for your patients and their families without significant financial sacrifice. If you work in a commercial clinic, another source of revenue is various value-based reimbursement programs. Three studies have found that SBIRT generates ample healthcare cost savings by preventing many expensive admissions and ED visits. If your clinic is part of a healthcare organization that's at risk for its patients' healthcare costs, SBIRT would be highly profitable. SBIRT can also help your clinic perform better in Medicare's Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS, and it can help your clinic qualify as a patient-centered medical home, which can help you get higher reimbursement rates from some health plans. FQHCs might be able to seek annual subsidies from local hospitals because SBIRT would help those hospitals avoid uncompensated and poorly compensated admissions and ED visits by uninsured and poorly insured patients. For example, if your FQHE screens and, if appropriate, intervenes for 1,000 uninsured patients in a year, and if your local hospital loses $1,000 a day for uninsured admissions, your SBIRT program will save your local hospital over $400,000 per year. So perhaps you could approach your local hospital and request an annual subsidy for your SBIRT program. Until you find sustainable funding, grant funding may be an option. In summary, SBIRT is a systematic, evidence-based, cost-saving approach to addressing the huge and often neglected personal and public health problems of unhealthy drinking and drug use. The sweet spot of SBIRT is brief interventions, which take training and time that most providers and medical assistants don't have. That's why it's critical to expand healthcare teams with dedicated SBIRT staff, whose costs can be more than covered through billing, value-based reimbursement programs, subsidies from local hospitals, grants, or a combination of those sources. One final thought, once you have dedicated staff for SBIRT, you could expand your program scope to address a variety of other behavioral issues and social determinants that primary care clinicians know are important but don't have time to deal with. If you think that maybe SBIRT could work in your primary care setting, here are a couple of SAMHSA-funded sources of free SBIRT training and consultation. 
Here is some peer-reviewed research on SBIRT's effectiveness and cost savings. And here are some additional authoritative resources. Thanks for listening.